How many of you are excited about it's a new year? How many of you are ready to throw the old one back behind you and let it go? Okay, well, I want to talk about that a little bit today since it is New Year's. Um, title of my message today is, It's Forgiven, It's Forgotten, Let's Move On. And uh, how many of you ever have read in the scripture something and you've read it before and you understand, you know, we have some of what I call Christianese things that we say that, you know, as Christians, this is what we're supposed to believe when we're into it. And then all of a sudden, you'll read a scripture that you've probably read before, and it's like a light turns on, and you see something there that you hadn't really seen before. How many of you have experienced that? Okay, so I'm excited today to share with you because I had one of those turn on light moments. And I have to tell you, it was actually um, kind of spurred on by a sermon that I heard. And uh, so this was some time ago, and I thought, wow, this is great because it really changed my thinking about something that we've all know. We know that God forgives, right? And we've all lived in that. We've all heard that at one point or another. And, you know, it's Christianese. We just accept that. But there was a point where something came on in my mind in a sermon that I heard that made me realize the hugeness of this. So I want to share some of that with you this morning. So for those of you who've made New Year's resolutions, you know, some of you have kind of gone into the uh, I'm going to do the diet thing. How many? Don't even show your hands. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to be a better person. I am going to read my Bible more than I've ever done before. Today is day two, right? How many of you have messed up already? Never mind, don't show. But I know that we go into that with this great tenacity of we're going to succeed and we're going to do it and it's going to be great. and Everything that happened last year is behind us and we're ready to move forward. And we're just going to, I can't tell you how many times I've made resolutions. And, you know, it's, I think someone said that if you can do it 14 times in a row, it'll stick. Okay, well, I'm just here to tell you at my old age, I've tried a few of those things and 14 days later, it's did and stick. So just know that it's okay, we'll get there. Um, but today I want to challenge you to do something different in your New Year's resolution. Um, not to think about all the list of things you're going to do, but I want to challenge you to do this one thing. I think it'll revolutionize your life. That is to live what you say you believe from the Bible. Okay, now I'm going to get into this, but here's the thing. This is a given. We believe that every word of God is true. So in case you don't, go work with me today. All right? And if you don't, that's okay. I'm going to challenge you to go figure out where it's wrong and then come and tell me. But as I have lived over my years of life, I have found that every word of God is true. And every promise that is in the Bible is true. And he will keep his promises. Okay, so just hang on to that thought. So I want to challenge you to live like you believe those promises exist and that they're real for you. All right, so starting off again, I said my sermon is about I'm forgiven, it's forgotten, moving forward. So I want to talk about this morning, I want to start off by talking about being forgiven. I want to go to the passage in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How many of us heard this before? Okay, so if you're in the Christianese world, this is not something that's unfamiliar to you. If we choose to take this just as it says, it says, if we confess our sins, this means that we're acknowledging that something's wrong. He, God, is faithful and just to forgive our sins. This means he will always forgive or erase or overlook those sins. They're covered in the blood of Jesus. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, remove all that is wrong. Or when we think of cleanse, we think of cleaning up something that is dirty. Do we not? Oh, you know, we're going to clean our house. We're going to clean our house because it's dirty. Because I don't know anybody who's cleaning their house because it's clean. Just a thought, just a thought. 
So practically, when we say that we're going to be clean, we're acknowledging there's something dirty that's got to be cleaned up. And God is able to do that. For most of us, that means that uh, we act a little different when we're clean. So here's an example. How many of you have jobs where you have work clothes? And how many of you have this? Somebody just said to me this morning, oh, you're always so dressed up on Sunday. Well, you know what? It does make me feel a little different. It's not like I'm running around in my sweatpants. Okay, well, how many of you act a little differently when you think you're dressed up a little more? When you've cleaned it up a little bit? We act a little different. So if God has cleaned you up, are you acting a little different? Just a question. Because we say that he's done that, and in our own lives, we've all experienced different times where we've changed the way we act or the way we feel because of how we're dressed or because of how we've cleaned. Um... So thinking about that, think about how you have changed because you know that God has cleaned you. Or have you? Well, I'm going to get to these notes. All right. So I want to go to uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation has come, and the old one has gone. The new one is here. Think about that. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. And the old is gone, and the new is here. How many of you are living like there's a new creation? How many of us purposefully have said, "Mm, I'm a new person today. I can live it a different way. Sometimes we don't think like that. Although we say we believe what God has said. And if he has said, you are new, what does that mean for you? Are you living differently? Are you living that new life? I remember every year for school, probably in August, we'd go shopping for the new outfit for the new day of school. And let me tell you, this was a big deal in my family. Probably firstly because it meant that it was some major expense that we didn't have a whole lot to have. But to have that new outfit for school, to have the new pencils, the new paper, and the new vim and vigor and belief that this year is going to be different. I'm going to be smarter. I'm going to see more A's. I'm going to work harder. And you walk out the door fresh and ready for that new day. And I don't know what happens by day three. Because the homework is kind of left over here. I might get to it. But on the first day, boy, I was zealous. I was looking good. I had all my clean stuff, all my right stuff. And then I don't know what happened to my thinking. Something changed. And I went back to the old. But it wasn't because I had to go back to the old. I just am not sure why that happened. So think about for yourself, are you living, again, that new life? Because you are clean and it's been changed. Then we get to the part where it says, it is forgotten. In Hebrews 8.12 it says, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities, and I will remember them no more. Are you living like God doesn't remember? So this is where um, I want to tell you the story about Abraham. Now you know that Abraham became the father of many nations. How many of you remember the little song you sang as a kid? Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just pray. Okay, you guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. Okay, well, you know, I used to be the children's pastor. I still like those little things. So 
Abraham was promised, God made a promise to him that he would be the father of many nations. And him and Sarah got old and still didn't have any children. And when God reminded them and told them that this was the promise, they laughed at God. Now, I know none of you would do that. Yeah, okay. So anyway, the story goes on that um, Sarah, going into the traditions of that time, decided that it was okay to give uh, Abraham her servant so that they could have this child. So this was, un, you know, kind of a thing that they did. But, you know, when God makes a promise, he doesn't make any exceptions. He doesn't change the rules. If he says that Sarah and Abraham are going to have a child, Sarah and Abraham are going to have a child. That's God's promise. But in their wanting to help God fulfill the... How many of you have ever tried to help God? You know that he needs our help, don't you? Okay, so Sarah was at that point where she recognized that God needed her help to fulfill the promise. So she sends over someone to help Abraham fill the seed. But um, that was not what God had designed. That was not God's promise. His promise was that the two of them would have a child. So Ishmael was born out of this um, servant, and later Sarah did get pregnant, and they had Isaac. Now, this was pretty cool. And this is where God kept his promise. But I want to read to you uh, the verse from Genesis 22, 2. And this is God talking to, uh, to Abraham. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moran, and offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you thereof. Here's the part that struck me that I had... You know, I've read the story of this before, but listen to this. And he said, take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac. Isaac was not his only son. He had Ishmael, who was the son that Abraham fathered through the handmaiden while Sarah was trying to help fulfill the promise. But when God forgave, he forgot and that's the part that just blew me away because he called, God is not stupid. God knows exactly what he's saying when he speaks. And he says here, thy only son, Isaac. Because the promise that God made to Abraham about the nations was through that son that he was supposed to have. And that's what happened. Now, when it says God will forgive and forget, he will remember them no more. Wow, is this proof that God does not remember? Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm reading this and thinking about this and getting ready to speak to you, I'm going, wait a minute, God is omnipotent. He doesn't forget anything. He remembers everything. He knows everything. So how does this work? How does he know and forget all at the same time? Kind of puzzling, isn't it? Here's the thing. When God is saying here, I believe, when he's saying here, I will remember this no more, he is not holding it against you. Okay? It's not that he is not mindful that it existed, but his reaction to you is not going to be because of a memory of something that was forgotten. So when God forgives you and he says it's forgotten, it's forgotten in the sense that he is not going to respond to you. He's not going to change his love for you. He is not going to change his promise for you because of something that happened. Because that part of it is forgotten. He's going to move forward. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're working in a, working in a grocery store you're the cashier. And for whatever reason, some quick little moment showed up and you had an opportunity and you did steal $30 from the till. 
and you've gone on, and nobody seems to be aware of it or catch you, but uh, you know that you did it. You come to your senses, and you decide you're going to have to tell the boss what happened. And uh, you go to the boss knowing you're probably going to lose your job. But you go. And you tell the boss, yeah, I stole the $30 that was missing from the till three days ago. And I'm sorry. And the boss says, hmm, yeah, okay. He says, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let this go. You show up for work tomorrow. Now, when you show up for work tomorrow, the boss doesn't say you're going to be stacking boxes in the back room or unpacking boxes and the shelves. He puts you right back at the cash register. What do you think about that? Now, this is how this would play out for most of us, I'm assuming. Ooh, he's trying to entrap me. He's watching over the corners. He's looking to see. I bet he's watching. And you're nervous working at the cash register because you're worried about what he may have remembered. But here the guy said, I'm going to put you right back out there. We're going to move forward. But you are entrapped by your memory of what's happened. And so you think about how you would be standing at that till knowing that you stole money before and the boss has put you back out there in that place. Are you worried about what he's thinking? Are you worried about that he's trying to entrap you? Are you worried about the hammer's going to come down as soon as you do one little thing wrong? So this is where, if this was you and this is God, God is not going to react to you because of what you did yesterday. He's going to let it go. He's going to forget it. You've got a new opportunity to do the right thing and to go the direction that you need to go. And when I read that verse where God says, take now thy son, thy only son, God is saying, I've forgotten what you've done. I'm not going to react to you because you didn't follow through, and I am still going to fulfill my promise. Is that an amazing God? Is that an amazing God? He's going to fulfill that promise. And we learn later on that, you know, God does fill that promise. There continues to be multiples, and eventually Christ comes descended out of that. God is not going to change his promise because of your behavior. His promise remains. And if we read through the Old Testament... You can see where God made a promise, but sometimes that promise was delayed. But the promise was always fulfilled. God has made promises in your life, and he will fulfill them. You have to choose to live that way. Um, I want to talk about Saul of Tarsus or Paul. We've heard the stories. This was the guy who was in great power, and he was persecuting the Christians. So shortly after Jesus died, he was running around making big issues about anybody who was following and serving God, serving Jesus. And he was very passionate about it. It's often said that he killed a lot of Christians. Well, I don't know that he actually did it, but he was instrumental. He was a part of what was going on. And he was doing this very vivaciously. This was just a part of who and what he was doing. And um, one day, he had an encounter with Jesus. He was out riding somewhere, and all of a sudden he fell off the horse, and the Lord said to him, why are thou persecuting me? Now, I don't know about you, but if I hear a voice and I'm not seeing anybody talking to me, I'm going to be a little nervous. And if this is the person that's talking to me is supposed to be the God that I'm persecuting, that I'm trying to kill people or get rid of these people that are serving him, this is going to be an eye-opener. However, that's funny that I say that because he was blinded. He was blinded for a couple of days after that encounter until Ananias came to him. But here's what came out of that. As tenacious as he was at persecuting the Christians or the followers of Christ, after his encounter with God, after he became a new creature, as he became a new creation, all the old stuff was washed up and cleaned up. He changed. 
And he is accredited for having uh, been one of the first missionaries. He was an apostle when he changed, going to the Gentiles, which were just, you know, we don't care about the Gentiles. He was a good Jew to make sure they knew of the love of God. And Paul says in Philippians, I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead. Powerful. He has made that choice. And I run straight for the divine intervention and the teaching of the heavenly goal and the gaining of the victory prize through the anointed of Jesus. He's pressing toward the mark of Christ to do what he wants him to do. But here is a man who had a life of persecuting Christians. And I am sure that those who knew of him and knew him were a little leery when he came around preaching the good news. I'm sure there were those that were concerned that this was a setup because after all, he was out there making sure the Christians were getting put away. And yet he chose to put that behind him. And he says, not within his own strength. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all that is in my past. How many of us are doing that? How many of us believe that we've been forgiven and that God has forgotten and we're putting it in our past? If, what would it be like if this year you literally thought to yourself, I'm going to believe what the word of God says. And if God is going to forget it, I'm going to put it in my past. And I'm going to move forward. How would that look? How would that look? Just think about that in your own life. What things do you need to let go and put in your past? How many of you need to stop depending on your own strength to do that? Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. So if you've become new, you've been forgiven and forgotten, he's begun a new work in you. How many of you trust him to complete it? How many of you are trusting him to complete it? Is this one of those Christianese things we say, we read it, it's in the Bible, we believe it, but do we act on it? Do we move on it? Are we cognizant of the fact that this is the direction, this is one of the promises there? Hebrews 10, 23. So now wrap your heart tightly around the hope that lives within us. Knowing that God always keeps his promises. Think about that. God always keeps his promises. There's no failure. In this, when he says it here, I don't see any if, ands, and buts around it. I don't see any, well, if this happens, then I will keep my promise. How many of us as parents or as friends have said, well, I'm going to promise you this, but you're going to have to do this. God made promises. And he will keep them. They may not come as quickly as you think they should come. But that may be because of what you're doing. You may be hindering him doing his promise. Because that's what happened with Abraham. He was going to help God along. God had to wait till he got finished helping him, and then 
let God do his thing. How many of us are believing the promises that God has made to us? Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That's a promise God has for you. Do you believe it? Do you live like you believe it? How many of you have allowed some of the things that have happened in your past to interfere with your accepting God's word and his promises? So when you say you're forgiven of your sins and they're forgotten, how many of you hang on to them and you struggle with them, you wrestle with them? And let's go beyond that. Let's go for those of us who've been Christians for a long time and we're not messing, we're, you know, we're doing pretty good. We've kind of gotten over our sinful nature and we're, we're moving on. But you know what? How many of us are hanging on to something like um, old hurts? Maybe somebody wronged you and you're struggling with that. That's something you haven't put behind you. And that's interfering with God's promises. Maybe you have an old anger thing. And I can just give my own personal example of that. Um, those of you who are parents, you know if you mess with my child, you mess with my child, you're in trouble. You know, you know what I'm talking about. So we had an incident that happened when my son was in high school. And a principal did something that was very wrong and it became very detrimental. And um, it irked me, to put it mildly. And I went over there and had a little chit-chat with him. You would not have wanted to be there. Okay, I did it nicely. But I was very angry about it. And um, I was even more angered because I didn't think his response should have been what it was. And um, I suffered through with that. And honestly, I have to tell you now, I look back and I realize that because I hung on to that anger... It interfered with God moving in my life. Now, as far as I'm concerned, it was righteous anger. I had a reason and a good reason to be mad at this guy and to be angry with him because, you know, you assaulted my child. You don't mess with my children. And um, I'd reached the point where I said I was willing to forgive him, but I wasn't forgetting a thing. So I'm not sure if that was true forgiveness because I hung on to that. And I went on with my life, and I was, you know, the good Christian, doing my thing, but it was something that I just did not let go of. And three years later, I'm still hanging on to this, um, and I'm realizing that it's actually impeding my walk with the Lord. Now, to be really honest, I don't see how that should have anything to do with me being spiritual over here, but it did. And sometimes when we hang on to things, the bitterness the anger, we're not open so that God can move in us. We're not open so that God can take the new creature, the new creation that we are and move us forward. Some of you have, um, I had to learn to let that go. Some of you I know have had hurts in your life. People may have wronged you. Uh, there were some damages. Maybe you're angry with God because he allowed something or I shouldn't even say allow, but because of the world in which we live, it's a fallen world, things happen, bad things happen to good people. And maybe you were one of those good people, and you know, you're serving the Lord, and some horrible thing happened to you, somebody wronged you, somebody offended you, someone said some very hard, detrimental things to you, and you've hung on to that. It stops you from moving forward. What... If you believe God's word, where he said he has plans for you, he has things for your future, what if you cognitively said, I am going to let that go, trust what God has said, 
and wait for him to fulfill the promises that he's made to me. What would that look like in your life? How would that look? What would that mean? See, God is not going to change the promise that he made for you because you're angry with somebody. God is not going to change his promise that he made to you because you did something wrong. The promise may be delayed, but it will come. What if you walked in that belief? What would your life look like? How would that play out for you? I'm going to go back, and it says in 2 Corinthians, reading this again, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, and the old has gone. The new is here. How many of us are living in that? How many of us really believe that the old is gone? Here's what's cool. God's mercies are new every day. Every day. We don't have to wait for a brand new year. You know, it's day two. We've already messed up. Okay, well, maybe you guys didn't. I probably did. Had a bad attitude already. So here's the thing. The morning, God's mercies are new every day. You get the opportunity to start new, clean, and fresh. And walk in the belief purposefully, that God's promises he will keep. He has plans for you. Some of us don't know what God's plans are for us because we're so busy worrying about our past and not letting go of those things in the past. So how can we find out what his plans are? Because we're busy wallowing around in this. Israelites ran around 40 years out there in the desert for a two weeks journey. You guys aware of that? God had a promise for them. He promised them the promised land. But because they couldn't let go of the past and they kept allowing things to interfere, they couldn't move in. It's 40 years. I do not want to be like them. Wandering around for 40 years for a two week trip. Some of us are doing that with our lives. God has made you a promise. He says, look, this is what I have for you. Read it in the word. I've got these good things for you. I have plans for you. Would you just let go of your past and move forward? But you see, God is not remembering it. Why are you? Why are you not letting it go? Why are you not moving forward? Paul said, I have purpose that I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let my past go. So here's a question for you guys. Thinking about your life today. I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want you to think about it. How many of you have ever purposely said in your mind, I am going to let it go? Those things in my past... I am going to let it go. I'm going to believe that God has said I am a new creation. The old things are behind me. I am letting them go. And I'm moving forward. The picture I had up here is a rear view mirror. Because some of us need to look in the rear view mirror and let it go. And move forward. And move forward. I want to share with you some lyrics from a song. Um, I heard this song a couple of years ago. It just, I just, it made me think. Uh, it's a Christian guy named uh, Mick Reynolds, and he wrote it and he sang it. And it, the words are, "I'm closing chapters. I'm turning pages. Glory to glory." 
from faith to faith, I'm moving on. I'm getting older, I'll keep it straight. It hurts to let go, but it hurts more to stay. I'm moving on. This is the part that I liked. I know my rear view can't compare to what God will do with my life. Think about that. I know my rear view can't compare to what God will do with my life. I have decided to move on. I am forgetting what's behind me, and I have finally decided I will be moving on. Is that powerful? How many of you are able to look in that rearview mirror and let it go? How many of you are able to consciously say, I'm going to let it go? I am choosing to move onward. I am choosing to move forward. I am going to choose today to trust what God has said, that his promises are real, that I'm forgiven, it's forgotten, I can let it all go, and I can consciously say, I'm moving on. That's my prayer for you today. That's my prayer for you for this year, that you are just willing to look and trust God's word. Just to say, I'm going to stand on the promises of God, and he has promised me good things. He has promised that my sins are forgiven. He has promised they are forgotten. I can move on. My rear view can't compare to what God will do with your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that you are a God who loves us greatly and that you are a God who is able to show mercy to us. You are a God that is willing to fulfill your promises in our lives irregardless of the things that we have done. But that when we come before you and become one of yours, we are cleaned up and the old is put behind us and we are new and fresh and we can move forward in the promises that you have for us i ask lord that each person that is here this morning would just take a look at their own lives and that they would recognize how much you love them how much you want to clean them up how much you want to fulfill the promises and that lord today we can step into a new greatness in our lives for you by letting go of our past. And we don't have to do this alone, Lord, but we have your power and strength to help us let it go. But help us this morning to be cognizant of that. Help us to be able to literally say, I'm letting go. It hurts to hang on, but it hurts more to stay. So, Lord, let us today wherever we are, whatever's going on in our lives, to personally say we're letting go of our past and we're going to cling to the promises that you have made and move forward. Lord, let this prayer be the beginning of a great new year for each of us, starting with one day at a time. Thank you, Lord, for your promises in our lives. Thank you that you have heard us today. Um, Lord, that as each person has examined themselves and have recognized what they need to let go of, that you will keep your promise and you will help them to let it go and that you will move them forward into greatness. And that, Lord, we will be able to look at each other and talk about what greatness did God move you toward? What promises is he fulfilling in your life? We thank you that we can look forward to that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.